Good evening and welcome to our Hawthenden event in celebra celebration of Zora Neale Hurston and the influence of American writers on British literature with the Black Girls Book Club, Jackie Kay and Selena Godden. I'm Molly Rosenberg, I'm Director of the Royal Society of Literature and it's my pleasure to kick off this evening's discussion of Zora Neale Hurston's life and enduring influence. Over a career of, that spanned more than 30 years, Zora Neale Hurston published four novels, two books of folklore, an autobiography and numerous short stories, as well as essays, articles and plays. Today, this leading light of the Harlem Renaissance continues to unite readers across the world, including our panelists this evening. I'm very pleased uh, to be sharing tonight with our co-host, the British Library, particularly as this evening's event forms part of the library's newly launched exhibition, Unfinished Business, The Fight for Women's Rights, exploring how feminist activism today has its roots in the complex history of women's rights. Welcome too to everyone watching through the Living Knowledge Network, broadcasting tonight via public libraries. It's lovely to have you with us. While we aren't able to be together at one public library we love, British Library, everyone watching can send questions as we go through the event online. You can do this at the bottom of the screen. Uh, you'll see a box that you can write into and we'll get through as many questions as possible at the end of the discussion. The event is also being supported by live speech to text captioning and thank you Heather for doing that. You can click on the button below the video to turn these on um, and, and have them throughout the event. At the top of the screen, as I'm navigating you around everything, uh, at the top of the screen, you can also find a tab for the BL's online bookshop where you can buy books by Jackie Kay and Selena Godden, as well as Zora Neale Hurston. So please do do that uh, at the beginning, during and at the end. Before I introduce our wonderful chairs for this evening, I'd like to thank the Hawthenden Charitable Trust for making tonight possible. We are hugely grateful. Leading us through Zora Neale Hurston's work, I am thrilled to introduce the co-founders of the Black Girls Book Club, particularly as they are celebrating a birthday today. So I hope we have lots of birthday celebrations. Melissa Cummings Quarry and Natalie A. Carter met at secondary school in Northeast London and bonded over their shared love of books. Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God and Alice Walker's The Colour Purple remain firm favourites. Years later, Melissa, now a business development manager, and Natalie, a real estate lawyer, decided to channel that passion for reading and form the Black Girls Book Club, a literature and social events platform that celebrates literature by black female writers. Now touted as one of the UK's top live literature events, Black Girls Book Club have hosted Bernadine Evaristo, Roxanne Gay, Mallory Blackman, Afwa Hirsch, Tiari Jones, Angie Thomas, and most recently, the RSL was delighted to co-host a book club with them last night. Melissa and Natalie were named as two of the booksellers rising stars of 2019, and their debut book, Grown, will be published by Bloomsbury in 2021. Over to you, Natalie and Melissa, thank you. So good evening everybody. I just want to say what an honour and a privilege it is to be here tonight. Imagine like I think meeting Natalie at like what 11 and a half, 12 and a half years old. We were so in love with reading, okay, <laughs> so in love with reading and with books and if you told me that tonight I would be chairing an event for the Royal Society of Literature with the British Library having Jackie Kay, the grand dame herself and the phenomenal <laughs> Selena Gooden, I would have called you a bloody liar. <laughs> I, would not, I would not have believed it and to have the honour to celebrate our favourite writer Zora Neale Hurston is just unbelievable. Zora for me is it when it comes to writing, when it comes to just the idea of black womanhood, she is everything and to be able to discuss this tonight with all of you it's just going to be such a joy. I think we've been waiting for a moment like this and to do it with such phenomenal writers, phenomenal voices, it's just going to be absolutely incredible. Definitely. Am I supposed to speak now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> pause, like a little pause for you babes. Oh, this is definitely going to be a traditional um, Black Girls Book Club event. Um, as Molly mentioned, it is our actually our fourth birthday today. Mm -hmm. And we had some really amazing plans until COVID-19 just tried to mash up 2020. But we're still here and really, really, really excited. Um, so, yeah. So how should we start, guys? Oh, we start? I have a little question, I think. And I wanted to start with really our kind of journey to Zora. So for myself, I found Zora, I was 14 years old. And I distinctly remember it because there was um, a bookshop, which is like RIP, sadly departed now, called Camden Lock Books um, in, is it Old Street? Old Street and um, Station. And Old Street, yeah. One thing about my mum, 
is she would never let me have anything I wanted. If I wanted kickers, no. Like Air Max trainers, no. But books, she would just let me have any book I wanted. So we went into the, this bookshop and this is when they had like a section which for black books. Yeah. And I was so blown away. And I thought, she said, look, just get whatever book you want. And I picked up this book, Their Eyes Are Watching God. I was like, what the hell is this? What does this mean? And I'm like, I'm quite naughty. because I always like pick books based on their cover and like on the title. So I thought, let me just read this. What is this about? And being 14 and reading this book, which was black womanhood, it introduced me to feminism. It introduced me to kind of just the idea of authenticity and exploring yourself and just kind of being yourself. And I just, I keep going back to this book. I think without finding this book, I don't know if I would have found myself. So my question to you both, and I think I'll start with Jackie, but how did you come to find Zora? What was your journey to Zora? Oh, it's lovely to actually remember what my journey to Zora was, because I also met Zora when I was young. Uh, <gasps> well, Do you not think as young I as, call you the Grand Dame. <laughs> not as young as not as young as fourteen, but I was twenty. So I first I first came across her in nineteen eighty one. So yeah, I was I was twenty years old. I was living in Brixton at the time. I was a student, um, but I was living in in uh, in London for the summer. I was a hospital porter, and um, and I went into a Sister Right bookshop. And that, that, that title just jumped out at me and I got Their Eyes Were Watching God and, um, and then I, I was hooked. And I was thinking today, just what an extraordinary thing it is to have loved somebody for, for 40 years, basically. Um, and, and yet to not feel like it's 40 years every time that I return to uh, her work, which is like all of the time. And um, she just feels fresh again and new to me and surprising. So I'm always finding new things in Zora and there's endless things to discover in her. And I was really shocked today when I realised that it was actually 40 years because I thought it was much less than that. But no, it's 40 years that I've been loving uh, Zora Neale Hurston's work. 1981, Brixton was burning. Um, there was lots of racism around. The Rock Against Racism movement was formed. Um, I remember working in Westminster Hospital um, initially I had green hair <laughs> and, and, and then I had to get it changed because I was a hospital porter and there was lots of kind of strange racism in the air um, at that time. Um, I remember when I went back to, to Stirling University, I was put up on the wall of um, these fascists, they put up um, these posters with my name on it and razor blades behind the posters and I was offered police protection. And it was, um, it was a very, very strange um, time for me. I remember a parcel being sent to my house then and thinking it was a parcel bomb. There was a lot of threat uh, in the air and Zora Neale Hurston um, was just like such an extraordinary comfort. And although I grew up in suburban Glasgow, I'd never met characters like the characters that are in the porch at the beginning of Their Eyes Were Watching God. They felt completely and utterly familiar to me. They yeah. felt like people I needed to know and they felt like people that I already knew. And that's the thing about Zora. She begins before she begins and she ends after she ends. She just is on a continuum with you. And Selena, how did you come to find Zora? Okay, well, first, I just want to say thank you for inviting me and also happy birthday and congratulations on four years of doing a Black Girls Book Club. I'm a massive fan of all you're doing. Um, okay, so how did I get um into Zora I have always been really in love with the way that um books lead you to books and great authors lead you to great authors I like to follow a paper trail of how people discovered writers so it was Alice Walker actually that got me into Zora and it was listening to her talks and reading her essays and her passion for Zora that made me want to find out who Zora was so I blame Alice Walker for my, uh, yeah, for getting into it really. I think we can all blame I'm, I'm the last one to the table because I only discovered her when Melissa said we need to read this book for Black Girls Book Club. I didn't, I was completely, I didn't know anything about her. Obviously I loved Alice Walker, so I completely missed that memo. And I remember when we were getting ready for our book club and I'm reading this book and I'm like messaging Melissa, like how could you have been my friend since I was 12 years old? And told me it's only like 18 years later only now you're telling me about this book I still I'll never forgive Melissa for that I'm just saying that <laughs> the book means so much to me so you think I would have shared it with her, but it was such a personal book for me it was such an exploration that it felt kind of even saying to people let's read this book I think it was the second book we did for book club and it's like a secret I was like Natalie there's a book 
and I really think we should do it. But I was kind of like embarrassed to tell her because I felt like I was opening myself up. Mm. So it's kind of that kind of feeling where I'm sharing something so personal with me. I'm so glad that I did because it was a book that not many people had read, I think at that point, um, when we kind of said to him, look, you need to read this book. But everyone fell in love with Zora. And I, and I did, and I think discovering her kind of later on in my reading journey, I just, every as I was reading the story, I was just thinking, I don't know if people have had that with books and you just like you just wish you read this book like 10 years earlier or you just wish you read this book as a much younger woman because it was so empowering and it just went against so many of the stories that I had read because my kind of reading history was slightly different because I would like steal books from my aunties like Eric Jerome Dickey, um, Terry McMillan kind of really salacious very kind of you no. know, romantic R&B type you know love is difficult but love is worth it type really kind of grown up books that I shouldn't have been reading at my age and I always kind of felt they followed this trail of like women just chasing after men relentlessly and kind of being these continuous heartbroken kind of powerless helpless characters so to read kind of their eyes were watching God and see someone from the very beginning like have relationships and make decisions to follow their heart and each and every time and go against the grain was it was it was kind of I don't want to stop be come across as dramatic, but it was very life changing for me, even in my own personal approach in romantic relationships as well. So for mm. me, I'm still very much on that discovering Zora Neil Hurston journey and reading and relishing her work and being excited about her work and still having that tinge of regret, feeling like, oh, why couldn't Melissa tell me about this 10 years ago, 12 years ago? But it is what it is now. But I'm on a nice journey because it's everything is new and fresh and really exciting to me about her and I feel I, I really do appreciate her more maybe if I would have read it when I was younger maybe I wouldn't have got it yeah I, I kind of think we've come across books when we need to yeah at, the, at exactly the right time so I wouldn't worry about the 10 years because um I think you yeah we're ready for books at, at different times it's almost like somebody's in the air somebody's in the air before you find them and uh, and whatever route sometimes we don't even remember the exact routes that that that, that took us to that person. I remember in, in my case, it was actually Mary Helen Washington who wrote about Zora Neale Hurston even before Alice Walker. And she wrote this great book um, that had different kind of chap chapters on different um, African-American women writers. And I was quite obsessed at that time with what finding- that that we wrote that down? Yeah. Mary Helen Washington. I'll do a mental note as well, Celine. Yeah. <laughs> Mary <laughs> Helen, let's say it again, Mary. Mary Helen Washington. So she was also um, instrumental um, uh, and her and Alice Walker kind of did, did this thing together. I think Alice Walker gets credited with it because she's the more well-known um, of the two. Um, but Mary Helen Washington was, was there first. And there was a kind of growing, there was a growing kind of consciousness amongst black scholars and academics um, around about that time in the, in the 70s um, to, to think, you know, what, what's happened to this woman? She disappeared from view. Um, you know, she was very well known, really, in the 40s, and then she just disappeared from view and and and, uh, uh, and died in the 60s. And then there was a whole, you know, there's a whole really 20 to 25 years where she was in the shadow, completely yeah. in the shadow. And there was a number of people that were studying and 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 writing and thinking this was the first writer that ever wrote a kind of lyrical symbolism. She was the first writer that rejected that kind of uh, earthy realism. And I think she got knocked out of knocked out of place when Richard Wright and writers like that came along with a different kind of realism because she had a kind of a magical realism. She was a kind of magical realist long before Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And I think what's really striking about her, her work is that extraordinary combination of realism and symbolism that coming to consciousness like n n none of us had ever read a book like that before of this young black woman's consciousness her her, her awakening and it's extraordinary and it, start, it starts right from from page one but in Zora's own time their eyes were watching God was 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 a, was a complete flop nobody got her she was a way way ahead of her time so it's kind of it's a salutary tale really to think that she died poor in an old people's home and she had an unmarked grave and it took Alice Walker going to find that grave in 1973 for her to be brought back really to the attention of people with her groundbreaking essay in search of her mother's gardens. But before Alice, there was, there was Mary Helen Washington and a whole load of other, other people. And I find that really, really, really fascinating to think that if somebody is a genius and somebody cares about their ancestors, then other people 
will find their bones. And it's kind of fitting for Zora, who was so fascinated with the return of people with zombies and folklores that she herself should have made this comeback, literally risen back from the dead. It's amazing. I loved it. <laughs> quiet for her. Now, I know some of you who are kind of watching, listening in, may not have read their eyes watching God. And we've got something very special because the Jackie Kay <laughs> a little reading for us. I'm just like in awe, like I can't wait for this. <laughs> well, I hope I do it. I hope I do it justice. And I should have said too, it's a real great pleasure to, to be here. And I really admire your work. I think it's fantastic because I really love the idea that you get out to a whole bunch of new readers out there. And that's just, just so exciting. Um, and it, it's it, it's exciting to think <laughs> to think of kickers shoes and mums and what you're allowed and what you're not allowed and to think of the context for for all of us how we come to how we come to books. So this this very first sentence of this their eyes are watching God, which is still probably um, her most famous book and will always be her most famous book. This particular edition I've got of it at the moment has an introduction by Zadie Smith, and it's also interesting to look at the kind of people that are. That are drawn to her, um, to Zora Neale Hurston, from Gary Young to Alice Walker to Zadie Smith. There's a whole load, lot of people banging at the door saying Zora. So, um, so, so, so here she is, um, page one. Ships at a distance have every man's wish on board. For some they come in with the tide, for others they sail forever on the horizon, never out of sight never landing until the watcher turns his eyes away in resignation, his dreams mocked to death by time. That is the life of men. Now, women forget all those things they don't want to remember and remember everything they don't want to forget. The dream is the truth. Then they act and do things accordingly. So the beginning of this was a woman and she had come back from burying the dead not the dead of sick and ailing with friends at pillow and defeat. She had come back from the sodden and the bloated, the sudden dead, their eyes flung wide open in judgment. The people all saw her come because it was sundown. The sun was gone, but he had left his fingerprints in the sky. It was a time for sitting on the porches beside the road. It was a time to hear things and talk. These sitters had been tongueless, earless, eyeless conveniences all day long. Mules and other brutes had occupied their skins, but now the sun and the boss man were gone. So the skins felt powerful and human. They became lords of sounds and lesser things. They passed nations through their mouths. They sat in judgment. Seeing the woman as she was made them remember the envy they had stored up from other times. So they chewed up the back part of their minds and swallowed with relish. They made their burning statements with questions and killing tools out of laughs. It was mass cruelty, a mood come alive. Words walking without masters, walking all together like harmony in a song. So that seems to me to be the most kind of arresting, arresting beginning because you, you already get, the sun's already got a character. You get the idea that mule, mules have a character, that this person has returned from seeing something really shocking, bloated death. So you, you, you know that there's been some drama happen and that there's these people watching in the porch, the community. Um, and she establishes all that in that page and a half. And you already want to know what's going to happen next. And the porch in their eyes are watching God becomes kind of a consciousness itself. It becomes a community. And um, I, I, I never grew up around porches like that with people sitting out chewing the fat and talking about each other in porches. But when I read that book, I longed, <laughs> I longed for that kind of community on porches that would watch each other go by and try and wonder what was going to happen next. And you already also get the sense that she's not phased by yeah. by surreal happenings um, and a sense of symbolism. So just, just in that page and a half, you, you're, you've already got that kind of emotional, lyrical realism, uh, a real porch, real people, but the idea that the sun leaves its marks across the sky. So I wanted to ask, actually, this is directed at you, Selena, and I think um, just as Jackie's mentioned it, there's an idea of lyrical realism. So I'm currently reading your new book, 
which is incredible. Really reading what? Your new book. Your what? new book. Yes. <laughs> Where is it? I've got it. Up. Where is it? Oh, you've got Free it. Free oh, order if you can. And like, I, I love a cheeky plug. Don't worry, Jackie. I'm going to plug all of yours next. But this is oh, thank phenomenal. You. And what grabbed me about it, because we've been reading um, for the book club we did yes. yesterday, this one, which is Zora's, um, hitting a straight right. lip right. right. stories. And what I loved about that is kind of like the poetry and then kind of storytelling. And I found that you do that as well in this. And I just wanted to know kind of where that influence comes from. Is it a bit kind of from Zora or is it just your, is it just the way that you write just naturally? I think with that, with um, that book, Mrs. Death, Mrs. Death, because we're, we're putting, we're imagining death as a woman, mm. um, as a black woman, mm. as a skinned, angry black woman. So just as soon as you um, do that, to, I think she would, she, uh, I, I pictured her just speaking, coming from different voices. So in, in one scene, she's a homeless woman pushing a trolley of plastic bottles. In another scene, a, 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 woman, a, a, a woman cleaning the floor in the hospital. And so all these different voices and different characters would sort of speak in different ways. So some of it is snips of diary, some of it pieces of in a, in a sort of dialogue, and some of it comes out as poetry because it's coming from different um, places, like not just different people, but different times and different eras and different centuries. So I wanted to sort of show sort of that, that you know, that that how I wasn't expecting to talk about my book. I'm all shy now. Ah, but yeah, so that's, that's <laughs> that. That's Black Girls Book that. Club, we're here to amplify the work of <laughs> Black women. And we'll just squeeze it in. Came to hear about Zora, but we're going to start Got to do it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that that was uh, that's kind of how how the book sort of came to me in um, dreams and visions and nightmares, nightmares, lots of nightmares. Um, is when you write about death as a, as a woman or imagine that death is female, you are instantly talking about the way men kill women or the way women are murdered or the way women disappear or you know very much uh, say my name the way black women aren't given justice and we go down a very different road to imagining death as a man. That's that's where that's coming from. Okay, I'm going to direct a similar question now to Jackie because when I was reading your phenomenal memoir, so this one, guys, Red Dust Road. Oh, I love that book. That, amazing. It reminded me that Zora has a memoir, Dust Track right. the Road. And I'm like, was that intentional? Because I'm just thinking as black women, we've all come to find Zora. We all love her. And it's in every kind of bit of our work and what we do, we find a way to kind of slip things in that kind of a testament to her. So I'm just wondering. Yeah. Yeah, that's lovely that you should, you should have noticed that. And Dust Tracks on the Road is absolutely, um, you know, another one of my favourite books of hers because in that book, she, she blends um, autobiography and fiction because a lot of her life she made up she was a she was a famous fantasist about her her own life um but she blends them effort effortlessly well and I, f I think that's I find that fascinating about the form Red Dust Road I called Red Dust Road for lots lots of different reasons one mainly because of the road in in Nigeria um and also because of Yellow Brick Road and and also because of Red Road Flats in Glasgow but also yes dust tracks in a road I was just thinking about um, the ways that roads lead you to places and the ways that you find yourself unexpectedly. And um, when I found this village in Nigeria, it was as if um, that my birth father is from. It was as if my own footsteps were on the road and all I had to do was walk into my waiting footsteps. And when I read Zora and her travels around the country, I mean, because she was an anthropologist and a folklorist and she collected stories. And in fact, I went to the library in, in Washington and looked at some of the films that she made. I had to make a special appointment. And I've got to see all of these films that she made of these of children's games um, and children playing. They're totally kind of fascinating, but she was endlessly fascinated by people's lures, habits and ways. And, and by making journeys and she made several journeys and it's I guess it's through making journeys that we get to find out about ourselves and other people so yes Red Dust Road was a journey for me of discovery too it was a bit like being a detective in your own life <laughs> and and going off and um, so yeah I'm, I'm glad that you you you, you found the wee echoes there but, but I um, love that book Jackie I've got that book that book's up there you're, there. Up, there. you're up there next to Kit Dewal yeah. Oh, that's nice. That's good company to keep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> side by side. That's nice. Thank you. 
Yeah, well, I, I find it really interesting what you were saying about death and Mrs. Mrs. Death and, and having to think about death in that way and characterise death because death comes in so many different guises and different deaths come to so many different people. And yet we are as a society, and particularly in this, in this country, quite str strange. Um, we, we don't really talk about death. And yet, and yet Zora has an extraordinary way of talking not just about death, but about zombies and about returns. And she's, she's fascinated with the idea that people have these other, other lives and other selves. And um, so, yeah, I find, I find the whole subject of, of, of death um, fascinating because I feel as if the, the conversation, like my, my, my dad, my dear dad died a, a year ago tomorrow. And my, my adoptive uh, dad, so he died the day after my mum's 89th birthday. And because uh, it's her 90th birthday today. And, um, and uh, but I, I like to think of the conversation continuing, if you like, mm. that the conversation with our, our dead doesn't necessarily just stop. I don't think it, I don't think it does. Um, and I think, I think when, when someone dies, we can kind of write about them and talk about them in a different way than when they were here and when they're alive. Um, I'm very sorry and send condolences for your dad. Thank you. My mum, my mum, who manages to be kind of witty about everything, said to me last year, Jackie, did I get this right? Your dad died the day after my 89th birthday. And I said, yes, that's right, mum. And she said, well, he was always lousy at birthday presents, but he surpassed <laughs> himself this time. <laughs> yeah. But, um, anyway, he's, he's very much with us with us today for this because he, he didn't he didn't live to see my mum be 90, but he was 94. And um, and I think about um, you know, Zora is that she she only lived into her 60s mm -hmm. and um and she died unknown um in this home and yet as Alice Walker said she didn't have a tragic life in the sense that she lived her life beautifully flamboyantly brilliantly um mm. for very very much of it and she was really really an independent woman a feminist way way um way way before the feminist movement really was properly formed and so um so I think that when we're thinking about Zora we kind of we have to think of her in, in lots of different ways. I agree. I feel like when it comes to Zora, I think I didn't meet her, but when I think of her, I think of her like she's a friend that you just gossip with over like a cup of tea or, you know, a glass of wine or something. She just seems so familiar. And it's yeah. from the way that she writes, the stuff that she talks about. She talks about things that are very normal, very mundane, but it's everyday life. I think that's what I quite like about reading the work, your works, both you and Selena, um, Selena and you, um, Jackie, because it's real life. And you can really, you realise yourself kind of within the text. And um, we were speaking about this yesterday um, in the book club that we did um, for Zora. And it's like, you'll read these phenomenal books that you can recommend to friends, you know, bestsellers, and they're amazing. But you read that book and you just put, you know, you put it in the bookshelf. And I think for me, Zora is that one book that The Rise of Watching Rod Gog is the book that you go back to. Anything that she kind of does, I'm just... I just, I'm just, I just gobble it up. Like I'm just, just, I'm just blown away by her. And always, if I'm being honest with you. And yeah. um, one thing, I don't, because I keep asking all these questions. I know Natalie's got a few, but the last thing I'm going to ask before I kind of let Natalie do her thing, yeah, really. Is that, say again, babe. That time, because you've just been going. Yeah, okay, I've been, I've been giving you pauses, <laughs> and I'm just like, giving you pauses, I'm and you're just sitting there, glowing, you. looking beautiful, and doing everything. But if I hear a pause, and I'm going to speak, I can't help it. Yeah, go on. The go question on. I want to ask. Is if I think for me, you know, you come to Zora and you adore Zora, but if you're going to introduce somebody to another author, another black woman writer, who would that be? Kind of in keeping with Zora, who else would you kind of introduce to people who've kind of read Zora but might may want to read somebody else in a kind of a similar mind? I would um, recommend that they read Audrey Lord. Mm. Yes, because um, I think she's a really good inheritor um of of, of Zora um but also well, obviously Toni Morrison because Toni Morrison wouldn't really exist if there were if if Zora and Neil Hurston didn't exist uh, because Zora Neil Hurston had um effortlessly the black gaze as um Toni Morrison later referred to it as the black gaze she wasn't interested in the white gaze and we don't even necessarily 
And notice that but when she creates these black characters, they're not written thinking about how white people are going to receive them. And that's that's a very interesting thing. So Toni Morris is probably the obvious inheritor. And I'd read absolutely everything by her. She only died just last year. Um, I'd start, I'd start um, with The Bluest Eye. And I think it's no coincidence that her title for, of her first book, The Bluest Eye, also has eyes in it when your eyes are watching God and has a character of Pecola Breadlove who thinks that she's ugly and, um, and, 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 and is seeing herself through this kind of prism. Um, so I'd, I'd recommend her, but I'd also um, point them in the direction of Zami, a new spelling of their name by Audre Lorde, because in that book, she mi mixes what she called it a biomythography, but she mixes fiction, biography, myth, and story, really, to create this uh, queer narrative of this, well, she called herself a black lesbian mother warrior. She had all these different names uh, after her name, and she was really believed in naming herself. Um, so, yeah, I would go for Audrey. Um, I was lucky enough to, to meet her and become her friend. Um, <laughs> So just to make everybody jealous. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you meet her? Well, I met I met her because I used to work for Sheba Feminist Publishers and we published Zami um, in the in the 80s, uh, 18, 1983. And I met her when she came over for the first international feminist book fair. And she stayed with me for two weeks in Stoke, in Stoke Newington in London. And then we just became sort of lifelong friends really up until she died. In fact, my uh, my son's bank account was opened by Audrey Lord because she'd done an interview for Spare Rib and they paid her a check of £60 and they said they'd be happy if she donated that check back. And she said, I can't get away with those women asking for their money back. <laughs> I'm going to give this to your baby, whatever you're going to have. And so she gave the 60 quid to me and, and I, I opened a, a bank account for my, my boy, who's now 32. Wow. So, um, wow. So yes, but um, but Audrey is one of these writers who's only just now actually uh, getting her day in the sun. And she's a bit like Zora as well, in the sense that when she was alive, lots of people knew about her, but not nearly enough. And now her work is being re reprinted by Penguin and people are people are all about Audrey. So yeah, I think they're perfect companions. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Who would you pick, Selena? Well, you beat me to it. I would have said, <laughs> I would have said Tony, and I would have said Audrey. But maybe um, contemporary writers like Claudia Rankin uh -huh. or um, Irene Sun Okoji. Uh -huh. um, she's right. She's writing some amazing short stories. Irene Sun, I'm really loving her work. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh -huh. They're the two. But I would, yeah, I think to Tony and Alice Walker are the two that seem to come straight away with uh, Zora to me. Mm -hmm. And I guess if I was thinking of, because, because when we think of African-American writers, um, and then we try and think of writers that are based, say, in European, um, black, black European writers, then it's a whole different thing that we're starting to, to, to think about. And that's interesting too. So if I had to think of a writer um, from this country, I'd probably pick Bernadine Evaristo because she also writes across form and she's written novels that are Good poems. Shit. Yeah. And um, so I would probably pick pick her and uh, and start with her earliest work and go right through to to her most recent girl woman other. Yeah, and I think it's just interesting um, talking about girl woman other. And then I like what you said initially about the kind of the porch being a community. And I think that's one thing that Zora Neale Hurston always got right was her way to kind of in a very very short and very very quick way give us the lay of the land for a community and even through reading the short stories that we discussed yesterday it seems in every story she manages to kind of very quickly build this picture of a black community mm. very very quickly so here you have it um that I was watching God when you have the main character coming back and you have all I call them the church sisters even though they're not the church sisters but in my head of my growing up in a Pentecostal church to me they sound like the church sisters someone comes back and someone's like you see so and so and she just looks like this and she just and she does that very quickly so I know that you said that you'd never grown up with that but when I read that that was like very much I felt at home immediately and you see that in some of the short stories as well with the straight lick with a crooked stick but then I think like you also kind of see different versions of it like with girl woman are the way that all the different characters end up being interdisposed and interconnected in ways that you would never ever expect and so just in terms of kind of 
now we're kind of moving into this phase where I feel like we're black British women writers are really kind of having their day. Like how does that kind of community building and kind of presenting black women as human and stories and not having to annotate the text to say she had dark skin or she her skin was like this or her nose was like this, her lips was like this. You just kind of read from the mannerisms and from the kind of just our understanding of who we are as a people that characters are black, you just don't have to announce it. So how does that kind of inform your writing in terms of getting it across to your audiences who you're writing about without having to signpost that this is a tick box, like black character? Mm. Mm. I never, I wouldn't do that. Yeah. I've no, I don't think, I, I like um, when I write prose, when I write characters, I want the character to be, um, what the reader wants them to be. For example, in the in this Mrs. Death, Mrs. Death, although I've been very um, ambiguous about the, the human character, Wolf. Wolf is clearly um, working class and black, but I, I really don't give much more away. I don't even say he or she. Mm. But some people that are reading the book think Wolf is a boy, and some people that are reading the book say call wolf a she and we're kind of liking that that people have their own sort of picture of who that person is in their head um so I, I like to to feel that I want people to do some work I don't like to give them too much in that respect but yeah that's yeah. just a, yeah yeah I like I like that um and I like that as a reader that experience of of, of being able to because I think as readers we do we create our own characters that's why so many people get disappointed at films of books because oh, they have, yeah. they yeah. have so far exactly. it's the film of this book uh -huh. I'm over it how many years later I'm still not over it it yeah. was terrible sorry let's yeah. call it oh, but how is it you and how no but Michael Ely was a very good addition to the book to the film because he looks nice not because he made any <laughs> oh, oh i thought halle berry was really pretty she was gorgeous but how is halle berry playing a 16 year old and a 40 year old i don't yeah. understand that that no yeah. they should remake it i think knowing what we know now and i think the kind of the idea that as black women we want to see ourselves on screen I think in the things that we've seen kind of, you know, with Ava DuVernay and all these beautiful, fantastic directors, it would be quite nice if they remade it. Because they're remaking, or they're, they're making Passing and by Nella Larson and, and that should be out next year. So I'd love to see like a redo. I think we deserve a redo at this point. I think Zora I, deserves I'd like to see a, I'd quite like to see a movie of her life, of Zora's life. I think that would be an incredible movie. Yeah. I would love to, I'd love to see that too, because I was yeah. thinking uh, just yesterday that she must have, she must have met Bessie Smith. You know, because she became part of the Harlem, what was known as the Harlem Renaissance. Yeah. And, and Bessie has her, her song, you know, up in Harlem every Saturday night. And, and, and about the highbrows getting together, the kind of literary, the literary types, you know, the Langston. It would be, it would be an incredible film. Yeah. I would just her, her fight with Langston yeah. for a start. Yeah, I was about friendship. To yeah. You'd have all that going on. You'd have her sassy kind of Mae West vibe, you know, this kind of, you know, really, really liberated, sexy, sassy lady vibe going on. You know, yeah. rumours of her you know, sexuality and, oh, it'd be just a fantastic movie. It really yeah. would. Yeah. And, and who would play Langston Hughes? I feel like Terence Howard would be um, Langston Hughes. <laughs> Your face. But who would be Zora? It has to be someone phenomenal. Who could Phenomenal. Play? Has to be a phenomenal woman. Phenomenally. <laughs> 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 yeah I don't know I don't know I can never think of questions like that of who, who it would be because sometimes the, the, the best person is, is a surprise um, mm -hmm. but, you know, to, to return to that question you asked about whether or not you create uh, the, the brush strokes of a character to actually signpost what colour they are um, I, I, I find that quite a difficult thing as a writer to, to try and um, navigate because um, because I grew up in Scotland and my main access really to, to language is mostly Scottish. I had to find a try, another way to be black on the page, if you like. Yeah. And so um, because if I if I just wrote Scottish, you know, in, in Scottish dialect, I wouldn't necessarily be 
black on the page. And I was kind of envious uh, for years of, of, of different Caribbean writers that I'd read or African writers or African-American writers um, or London-based black writers because they had access, you know, a writer like Zadie Smith had, had mm. all access to, to a whole different kind of London than, than, than the, the Scotland that I had access to. So in order to be black on the page, I, I kind of used blues, refrains and rhythms and draw upon all sorts of other things to make myself a language, if you like, um, a, a language that is not necessarily one that I hear spoken, and mm. um, and so that's that's been that's been something. But it's been quite an, an interesting thing to think about um, for years. And then I remember when I wrote uh, Trumpet, I was just really interested in creating this 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 character, this kind of Black Scottish character who, is, you know, is born. Um, a woman and then identifies as a man and and I use the the male pronoun all the way through and that that book was published over 20 years ago and it's probably seen now as being kind of a gender fluid or gender bender book but um I, but I was thinking it then about the fluidity of identity and how we're we're um, always kind of say so-and-so's so -and -so's black so-and-so's a woman so-and-so's working class and actually our identities are much more fluid than that the kind of fluid in the way that jazz is fluid mm -hmm. so I'm kind of interested in trying to do that with with characters and in, in, in making my making my characters fluid a bit like as Lena was saying I like the reader to kind of come along with me and yeah um, and make them up and, and and for me I'd like a reader to be outraged if Joss Moody was referred to as a she to be outraged on Joss's behalf um so it's yeah it's kind of yes yeah, the battle of the pronouns was with that book you just had like a, a question from the audience and I was I was actually going to ask this now. Yeah. I mean, you know, I've seen it as well. I know exactly which one you're going to ask. Do you think Zora will ever be respected as a writer rather than a black writer? Was that the question you expect me to yeah, ask? Yeah, of course, of course. I have, my, I have my views on that, but I yeah, love thinking what you guys think. For me, it's... For me, she is a writer. She just writes for me. Yeah. And so as far as I as far as I am concerned, she is respected as a writer, but I understand that we always refer to her as a black woman writer, we always refer to her blackness. But then I don't know if that is because it's not to say that being a black writer is like and recognized respect as a black writer is not the same as being recognized as a writer. I get what the question means, but I'll always refer to her as a black woman because of the stories she told and the way that she spoke to me. And the way that this kind of small nuances and the small points that she puts in her story really touch me. But I mean, to me, as far as I'm concerned, she's just a writer, she's just writing for me. I don't know what else there is to say about that. What do you guys think? Is my I think she's, a, she's a black woman writer and that is it. And I think, I find it interesting that we can suggest, I don't know, will she be respected as a writer? I think she is. We're here discussing her for two nights in a row because she's so phenomenal. And we've got Jackie Kay, we've got Selena Good, and we've got, you know, Tayari Jones wrote the foreword, Zadie Smith wrote a foreword. She is respected as a writer, but I am going to signpost that she is a black woman and she is phenomenally so. So for me, she's a phenomenal white writer, respected and a black woman. I think sometimes there's this idea, and it's actually the reason why we founded Black Girls Book Club, because there's this idea that black people don't read. There's this idea that we don't have phenomenal writers amongst us, and we do. So I think it's really important to say, actually, this is what black people have been doing. We've been writing for years, hundreds of years. It's not something new, you know, it's not Bernadine of Arisso's just got the Booker Prize and it's, you know, a diversity chick. No, this isn't new. This is, we've had Jackie Kay. Like I grew up reading Jackie Kay. You know, when I said to my mum, oh, I'm doing an event. And she's like, oh yeah, then that's cool. And she said, oh, you know, what's kind of you and Natalie? I said, oh, Jackie Kay. And she was like, you've made it. <laughs> How gratifying. <laughs> Hi. Say, hi to, say hi to your mom for me. We'll say hi to my mom. So for us as black women, I think that, and I think black people, but as black women, there are black women writers that have changed our lives. Yeah. So for me, when I say that this person's a black woman writer, that's with, with the utmost respect. And that's just my thought. But I'd love to hear what you guys think too. Um, I, I think the question kind of implies that if you say that somebody is a black woman writer and, mm -hmm. and, and categorize them, that that somehow makes them less. And the, 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 behind the question is, is a kind of is a kind of unsaid impl implication. And uh, I, I don't agree with that. 
Um, I understand what the question means um, and I understand the kind of weariness and I understand that people feel protective of black writers because they want black writers to be taken as seriously as white writers without having to define. But we still live in a world where definitions and namings are necessary. And, uh, and I, I'm with Audre Lorde on that one. I'm kind of proudly black Scottish writer. Um, I, I, I kind of get annoyed that Martin Amos doesn't have to describe himself as a white English heterosexual writer. And I get tired of people always, you know, saying black lesbian Scottish writer in the way that they wouldn't necessarily with, 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 with white male heterosexual writers. And, um, and, and that, that can be tiring. Um, but I think that it's, uh, I think the question's slightly dated in a way. I think hopefully, okay. hopefully we've, we've moved um, someplace, someplace else. I mean, I remember this question happening sort of 30 years ago. I remember saying to this woman that was interviewing me for a Scottish newspaper, um, she asked me about being black, lesbian and Scottish. <laughs> and so I said that I was kind of tired of people always having that as the headline. Mm. And, and, and then the very next day, the the article came out this is like yeah 30 years ago and the headline was black lesbian scottish and i remember my gran at the time <laughs> she's dead a long time now but she was very shocked she, she didn't seem to realize that i was a lesbian even though i'd taken successful girlfriends to her house for gingerbread <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and she phoned up my mum and said does a fair can about this which means uh does her father know about this? And then she said, well, there's one thing, no money people read that big paper. Because <laughs> <laughs> it was a broadsheet and, and not, a, not a tabloid. But anyway, um, but yeah, it, it, kind of, it kind of amuses me because it, it sort of, it, it, yeah, I, I feel slightly impatient. I feel like um, we, we have to say, it, we have to say, Black Lives Matter. We have to. We're living in a time where we have to. We have to state that. And I think the people that say, "Oh, all lives matter," miss the point. Really. Yeah. I don't know what you think, Selena. But I just. I just agree with you wholeheartedly. I, um, I think as well. Can I just speak how I feel? Yeah. I feel yeah. that, that Zora very much was someone that you can't really put in a box or label. Yeah. She was very complicated and 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 a very very not just a one a one trick pony she really had you know her own she really did her own thing when her work came out it was because of the way she wrote it she wrote it with the vernacular and the slang of of country folk of black country folk and because of that she was actually looked down on perhaps much in the same way we might look down on rappers or or you know or, you know someone drunk talking like air you know because they're not speaking the queen's english or, and so educated um, black people kind of looked down on her and, and thought that she was doing like a kind of a black tap dance for white readership very much in the same you know kind of like the watermelon smile that in some way she was selling out but actually she was authentically describing the people that she grew up with the town that she loved that she didn't even change the name of Eatonville she even used the real name of the town where she grew up and she was being authentic and an observer and a narrator and that's that's powerful that's that's a performance in itself it's going I'm gonna be vulnerable and I'm going to show you the truth. And I know this might not make me look good in some lights, but this is how it looks and this is where I come from. And that's an incredible, incredibly brave thing to do in writing, I think. I think that I think that's absolutely true, but I don't see why she she can't do all of that and acknowledge that she's black and she did. I mean, she, yeah, she, said, yeah. she said, I'm not tragically colored. There is no great sorrow dammed up in my soul nor lurking behind my eyes. I do not mind at all. I do not belong to that sobbing school of Negrohood who hold that nature somehow has given them a low down dirty deal. Even in the helter skelter skirmish that is my life, I have seen that the world is to the strong, regardless of a little pigmentation, more or less. No, I do not weep at the world. I'm too busy sharpening my oyster knife. So, I mean, that's a perfect quote, really, to, 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 to do what you're saying. But I don't think these things are mutually exclusive. I think that you can be complexly yeah. um complexly consciously black and I think that actually in her in her time oh I didn't mean it like that I didn't I didn't mean it like that I meant um you know in the way she voted and the way that she oh yeah yeah no, she's, she's, middle, 
And she, she actually wrote about middle class black people as well. I mean, and she wrote yeah. about edu educated black people. She, um, she, she wrote about a whole range of a range of people. Um, I, I think the, I think that initial question was whether or not somebody should be described as a black writer, whether they should just be described as a writer, and that's that that was a question. And um, and yeah, um, well, anyway, I think there's there's, a, there's loads and loads of different ways to see it. It'd be interesting what she would say herself, where she were yeah. to bring her back uh, to the year 2020, she'd go, what? You're still talking about that? <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, but, but, but she was kind of disliked by certain people um, that came after her because they, like the, the Richard Wrights, for instance, or the Anne Petries of the street, because they didn't, they, they, they went for a kind of a realism and a naturalism, and they didn't, they felt that, that Zora's writing wasn't um, uh, black enough. And so there was just so many different ways. I mean, I think that's why she's such an interesting figure and why she'll be discussed endlessly. And there'll be so many disagreements about what it was that she was trying to say. And that's wonderful because she's just, she is, she's, she's so complex. Mm. I think Toni Morrison, um, you know, it saddened me that when she got the Nobel Prize for Literature, she actually said that she was hoping that they gave it to her for the right reason. And, and I thought that that was really sad that you get to be a writer of that stature, of mm -hmm. that magnitude, of that kind of genius. And you still have to be asking yourself when you get a prize, if you've been given the prize for the right reason. So, yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it's a hard world for, for black writers of all different kinds still, I think. Yeah, here, here, Jackie, to write. Right. I think it's just, it goes to kind of that point about, and I think that's why we love Zora, because while I think she was battling against the trend of what I call like respectability politics, the idea that you had the Renaissance and they were very kind of like, this is how we want to portray black people. This is the conscious measures that we want to give. And her stories about Eatonville and kind of these kind of, not country bumpkins, but country people who seem to be quite simple and seem to be quite vulnerable, didn't fit in that, that kind of story that they were trying to portray and trying to show that kind of respectability of the kind of new black middle class. And so I, but when I read, especially like their eyes are watching God and specifically the short story collection, I feel like she's done us, she's done us an amazing service by preserving history. Yes, that's knowing right. how those people actually lived and what their vices were, what their struggles were and showing them to us as they actually were. And I feel like if she hadn't have been that authentic with those stories, we wouldn't have had that piece of that genuine yeah. history about how those communities live. So yeah. she, but, but Eaton, Eatonville yeah. itself was the first town, the first black led town. And it was right. the first town that had a black mayor and her own father was the mayor of the town. And so Hurston's father and the church that um, you know I, I did this um, program about her that's actually still available on the radio called the Women Half in Shadow but um but they they found for this radio program a woman that had met so she's ninety nine now and uh, she actually appears in one of her stories and uh, and she she was talking about Zora and and the church and how she mixed with everybody and how she didn't have any highfalutin ideas about herself that she was very clever everybody knew that she was very clever but she could mix with absolutely everybody and she loved that that town because the town was consciously led by black people um, and, and was kind of remarkable in, in that way. And the woman on, on, on that program at 99 was describing how Zora talked about there being two croquet lawns and she goes, well, they don't have croquet anymore because nobody plays croquet anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we've got an, another question as well. Yeah. Um, I read it, babe. Yeah, I <laughs> do you want to read it, Melissa? Oh, no, don't mind. Okay, so uh, this question I kind of feel like Melissa and I can answer this one as well. Is that how do you think your early writing or reading lives would have been different if black women writers had been part of your school curriculum? Mm. Mm. Selena, do you want to answer that first? Because I've got a lot to say, so I let everyone. <laughs> How would my reading and writing have yeah. been different if I hadn't just been told to read stale, pale males all through school? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> How much time do we need? <laughs> okay, well, 
I don't know. Where do I even begin with this one? Um, it's like a whole talk within itself, isn't it? Like another, yeah. Like, How would it have been different? Would it have been different? I, do, I, I absolutely cannot answer that. I'm pleased. Can someone else take this question? I, I really... I'm Jackie. Just, Jackie okay, has I'm just, an answer. I know she does. I'm just yeah. like... I can answer then for a little minute. I, I think my life would have been very, very different um, if I'd come across right, these writers earlier. Um, because because you, you see yourself in what you read. And if you're always having to imagine yourself into what you read, you know, like Anne of Green Gables was okay. <laughs> but, uh, and she was, she was fostered. And she had red curly hair. Um, but, um, but, but yes, I didn't really, the only, the only black writer that I ever got at school uh, was Wooly Soyinka in a poem, Telephone Conversation. And um, I remember, I remember that, that poem very vividly and being in the class and being the only one that understood it because it's a poem about racism and someone going for a house and, and, he, and there's this a kind of ironic line and it says that, Madam, my bottom is bent peroxide blonde. And I remember being the one in the class that understood that because people always asked me in my school if my bottom was the same colour as the rest of me, which was really kind of offensive. Um, but I, but I understood, I understood that. But it was one of those examples, early examples, really, of literature being fourteen, fifteen, and something really resonating with you, with that kind of ping um, of recognition. And um, yeah, reading um, keeps you enormous company. So when I did come across writers like Audre Lorde and Zora Neale Hurston and Sonia Sanchez and Nikki Giovanni, and they're mostly African American writers in the beginning, in the in, in the late seventies, early eighties. I just kind of fell upon them gladly and kind of wolfed them down. Um, mm. So I think I think my childhood would have been different if I'd had um, yeah if I'd had Mallory Blackman, for instance. Mm. Uh, I think I feel I was quite lucky. Um, my mum, she loves to read, and I think she made a distinctive choice before we even kind of knew how to read to actually ship books from America and the Caribbean with black characters. So she made that distinction. She ensured we kind of had yeah. that for us to read. So if I'm being honest with you, I was thinking about it. And I do believe we need to have black books in the curriculum, especially now. But back then when Nat and I were in school, and we did have a fantastic English literature teacher, um, I just don't think they have the range. Could you imagine like a book like, like Their Eyes Are Watching God and then having to read that out loud and then and them saying, Natalie, you read it because you're black, you'll understand what it means. I, I think it'd be very, very difficult actually having the books by Zora Neale Hurston and all these phenomenal writers and people who don't get it, who don't understand our stories. Because one thing about the book club, which I've learned is that because we have something in common, we have a shared commonality, that we don't have to explain ourselves. We just say, did you see that bit in the book? And do you know that how that made you feel? And a lot of the times when I speak to my friends who don't have the same kind of background as myself, they just don't get it. I don't know how I would have felt at say 12, 13, if my discovery of Zora would have been through my English teacher. I, I don't, I don't know. I'll be wow. honest with you. I can't I mean, imagine. Just, just as you said that, I was remembering being, being at school and our teacher reading um, Fitzgerald, Mm. And I'm also thinking of, um, and also Cider with Rosie, both of which my teacher would do in the accent, um, and and both of which are far away from us, and both of which, you know, this kind, the kind of um, As I Lay Dying, Fitzgerald, you know, and do this kind of deep Southern accent and do this whole thing. So I, I remember just thinking, you know, it, it was always, it was always, yeah, men, most of our books were by, were by men that we were taught at school. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. As, you, as you were saying that, I was remembering that the one book that we did get at school that had a black character and it was the kind of racist uh, little black Sambo, um, <laughs> which, which was really dreadful. And lots of people called you Sambo because of, because of that book. So there was these kind of caricatures that were mm. highly, highly offensive. Um, and that, that's, all you, that's all you had, really. You had little black Sambo and then you had Roots on television round, round about when I was... Uh, 16 Roots came on television by Alex Haley mm -hmm. and that book became available but then people would call you Kunta Kinti walking through Bishop Briggs Park so they, 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 they shout they stop you and you go Kunta Kinti Kunta Kinti Kunta Kinti and I'd think well are you not even listening to this <laughs> you're not even watching it don't you even understand so there was that kind of strange thing of, of something you know I understand what you're saying it's quite a complex thing that you're saying of of um, of of, of when, when, when writers are so precious to you, 
who to trust. Because we were lucky in our, in, 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 was it the anthology, Natalie? Jackie Kay was in our anthology. But now when I think about it at the time, it's not that there was any distinctive, this is a, you know, a black Scottish, you know, poet. There was none of that. And I think, I don't know, I just don't, I wouldn't have trusted. Now older, wiser, I don't think I would have trusted um, mm. any teacher to introduce me to the work of black writers. And I'm very glad it was my mum and my best friend, um, that I kind of was able to go on this journey with. That's my wow. take on it. Wow, I think that's really fascinating, really interesting. Yeah, for me, I feel like I had a real yearning to read that book, which is probably why I ended up reading a lot of stuff that I shouldn't have read and reading like lots of these salacious, you know, sexy time scenes and things like that of really, really adult books because I was really hungry to, to know black stories to read black stories to, to see black women to see black characters and I kind of we were both very good at English we were both in the top set and so while we were, were very good at English lit and it came to us and there was clearly an appreciation and love of reading it was like I was doing what I was doing at school because I had to and then I was going to Tottenham Green Library to kind of get my fix yeah or go into like my um my dad's younger sister's bedroom at my grandma's house and kind of stealing her books that she's reading to try and get my you know kind of get my my black writing fix and it's part of me kind of discovering my identity as well and so part of me does agree with Melissa 110 percent I couldn't imagine that some of our teachers doing their eyes were watching God they were completely butchered it and then we would never appreciate it for what it was but part of me just wonders if there was just like a little bit more balance maybe that would have kind of quenched at first to me in a better way and introduced me to a better I don't want to say better class or but maybe better books that would have quenched the first that I had to understand black characters and to see myself on the page which is probably a first that really hasn't been quenched which why was one of the reasons why we set up Black Girl Book Club because we just wanted to just just read about black women by black women and read our stories. And that was some, when did we say that? How old were we? Don't want to give away my age. We were like, what? 15, that's all we have to say. We don't need to give away our age. Just know we're on the other side of 30. That's all people need. So that's that's really 15 years after I've left education anyway. So, you know. Why don't you want to give away your age? Because, you know, I'm timeless. (laughs) (laughs) Timeless beauty. I'm I'm going gray, so it's not like I can hide my age, so. I will, give, I will give away my age. <laughs> I will give away my age right oh, now. Go on there. Very I'm 58. Well, damn. Mm. I'm 48. 48. Yeah. I'm 48. Please say you're 38 and then we can just do a thing. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> can I just say, I'm just amazed. I'm in this like... You should have kept the ages to yourself because you do not look that age. Yeah. Like, I don't think you guys should have said that. I like I like being 58. I find the older I get, the better it gets. I really don't. Know. I've heard this. My mum, my mum is my mum is 90 today. It's like you know, <laughs> she's 90. I'm just I'm pointing down the room because they're all sitting very quiet down there. We have to get. Oh, this hello. <laughs> they're all shouting hello. Yeah, you have to come and say hello, Suzanne. Come, yeah, come and say hello, to this me. Yeah, but um, yeah, and I've got this wonderful black Scottish jazz singer here, Suzanne Bonner, who's my sister. She's here for my mum's birthday, and they're all sitting down the other side of the room, being quiet. Great so job. It's actually like, a good job because if it was me, I would have walked half by now. I would have had this, to... is, this is my sister. This is my sister. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, she's been singing to my mum and all sorts. Of <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yay to <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, so um, yeah, but my mum's ninety, and she just like owns it, own your age, own everything about you. Yeah, totally, totally, own your age. I'm only my age, but I'm still not giving away because I'm aging. Okay. Okay. But um, we've actually gone past the time, as with every single book club event, we've actually gone past the time. This is only four minutes this time. It's only four minutes. Not too bad. We actually have like a really, hi Molly, a really, really special treat for you guys, um, just to honour um, Queen Zora. Molly, do you want to explain, let the people know? I can do. Well... First of all, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to Melissa, Natalie, Jackie and Selena 
that was amazing. Uh, and I think that everybody's going to hate me for drawing this to a close now. <laughs> um, if you want to come to more events like these for free, and let's face it, you do, please join the Royal Society of Literature. Our membership starts at £40 and gives you free access to all the RSL's events, our publications and book groups. Um, we only pray that we can do one with you guys again. Um, oh. Of course. Members will also have special access to the RSL's birthday announcements at the end of November when we turn 200. So please join us. Um, we're already four. <laughs> <laughs> and it, we're not shy of our age either. Um, <laughs> so please join us through rsliterature.org. Uh, our next event with the British Library is on the 19th of November when we will be joined by Lauren Elkin, Linda Grant and Shivani Ramlochan to talk about what is so great about Jean Rees? Uh, that celebration of Rees's work marks 10 years of the Caribbean Bocas Fest Literary Festival, as well as 200 years of the RSL. Members can register uh, by the RSL website, or you can get public tickets through the British Library. A big thank you to everyone at the British Library and my colleagues at the RSL and to our producers, Unique Media, for making tonight possible and to the brilliant Heather for captioning throughout. Um, thank you too to the Living Knowledge Network for broadcasting this and sharing it with public libraries across the UK. Uh, I think we all know how important those libraries are to us now as always. Um, and thank you everyone for tuning in.